Thank you. Good morning. So excited to be here. I applaud you. For those of you who stayed to the bitter end, thank you. I know you guys were having a good time last night, so I was praying that y'all would come this morning. Um, but really excited to be here. First, before I get into my remarks, um, I want to thank Molly. Thank you so much for your leadership and for allowing me to be here today. For my colleague and friend, Lynn, um, she is tremendous. Um, she recently joined our national board, and I will tell you, when she speaks, people listen. She's very well respected, and we're excited to have her around our leadership table. And I want to congratulate Dr. Ono. Wonderful work. Thank you for your leadership and your courage. You know, today I wanted to, when they asked me to come and speak about leadership and change and what we're doing at the Girl Scouts, I thought about you in the audience. Many of you are probably saying, Girl Scouts? Higher education? Don't get this. So I want to spend a few minutes just level setting about our organization, what we're working on, and then we're going to do some Q&A right after my remarks, so it'll give you an opportunity to ask me about our journey, and also, as Lynn was saying, some of the things we've been dealing with in this 21st century context. First of all, I want to say that I'm extremely honored to be here with you today because I believe you are the heroes in our community. I grew up in an environment where I clearly knew from a very early age that education was the secret. It unlocked the power opportunity for kids like me. And I know that you are challenged, both from a budgetary position, but also from a social context, to do your job every day. And I just wanted to personally thank you for that work. You know, as the CEO of Girl Scouts of the USA, uh, we've had the opportunity to work with girls and women and men for 104 years. And people ask me, Anna, what is the thing that keeps you up at night? And for you, it is literally driving a legacy organization into the future when our context is based on rich history and also understanding that it's sometimes it's a tug and pull with that history and that legacy to ensure that we're relevant today. For those of you who weren't members of the Girl Scouts, let me tell you about what we have done for 104 years. We do serve girls ages 5 through 17, K through 12, and we are one of the few all-girl organizations that really understand the need to give girls that safe space to really explore and to understand their inner power and their ability into their future. We also have approximately 300 members, 3 million members, excuse me. We're in every zip code in the United States, and we're in 90 countries in the world. A lot of people don't realize that global impact, but that was really future thinking on our founder's um, behalf. She really wanted to understand the impact of girls domestically, but also wanted them to be global citizens. And so since that point, we have been serving American girls overseas. Many times they are connected to military families, to families that are working in the State Department, or individuals who are working for American corporations abroad. I recently had the opportunity to travel to Europe to visit the Girl Scouts in Germany and Rome, and I will tell you that they continue to do great work, even on foreign soil. And they're always interested on what we're doing here domestically. And the, one of the reasons I think our mission has stayed relevant for 104 years is we understood from a very early period in time, long before women had the right to vote, that girls needed to be empowered to own their voice, but also understand they didn't have to be in their 20s or 30s to be leaders. And we've actually used our ability to really look at girls and to study girls to understand that that decision to be a leader starts very early on. And I think that's the connection we have with your organization, is that we have found through our own Girl Scout Research Institute that girls stop raising their hand in fourth grade. They start getting messages around their ability to lead very early on. You may recently have seen a campaign we did with Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook around banning the word bossy. How many women in, the, in your organization or here in the room today, when you are leading an organization or perhaps around a decision-making table, have been called bossy? Come on now. Look around you. How about the men? Yeah, that happens, right? And we teach girls that even though they may be given those labels, that they have to respect the fact that they do have something to give back. 
And so we start very early on. My earliest leaders, youngest leaders, are five years old. They're the daisies, right, in the blue uniform. They're adorable. The average age of my boss is eight years old. And I got to tell you, they know how to give me direction. And what they say is, why do people call us bossy when all we're trying to do is display our ability to solve complex problems? And what I tell them, well, this is how it works sometimes. Imagine a classroom, and you've got 50 kids, 25 boys, 25 girls. And then the teacher walks in and says, boys and girls, I have a really complex problem that I need you to solve on behalf of this great country. So she goes, and she writes the problem on the blackboard. But in this case, it's now a smart board, right? And she writes the problem. But before she allows the class to actually solve the issue, she asks 20 of the 25 girls to leave the room. And she leaves the five girls and the 25 boys to address the problem. That's what's happening in this country today. Girls are getting messages about why they should have an opinion. And when they do raise their hand, they're given looks. And I will tell you, having done many studies on this issue, actually, it's girl-on-girl -girl crime many, many times. They perpetuate the sense that girls have a particular role. So that's why we start so early on in Girl Scouts, to really give girls the opportunity to lead. And because we know this based on our own original research, that girls, interestingly enough, approach leadership very differently than boys. Now here's my caveat. I'm a lawyer, and I was an ethics advisor to two cabinet secretaries, so I'm always going to tell you the truth. Here's my disclaimer. I am raising a really handsome 14-year-old boy. But I'm also raising two million girls. And when I explained to him about the different leadership styles, I said, well, girls look at leadership a little differently. Um, they spot an issue, then they gather a group of people around, get input, sound familiar? Get input, right? Then they delegate, oh, why don't you cover this? And then they say, okay, who wants to present the solution? Boys, on the other hand, see an issue, come up with a solution, get in front of the group and say, charge ahead, I'm going to lead. And so girls, again, as they look across the leadership spectrum in many different industries, sometimes they don't necessarily see their own leadership voice. Now, I'm not even going to get into the political scene today because I'd get in a lot of trouble. But if you're watching the current news, you can see different leadership styles being displayed. <laughs> and I will leave it at that. So why do we think this is working and has worked for 104 years? Well, first of all, for those ladies who raised their hand, um, you know the power of Girl Scouting in your life. And because we have been an inclusive organization for 104 years, we really have a large tent. We, in our membership base, represent members of every religion, every social economic background, and because we were desegregated many, many years before any federal law required us to do so, we understand the power of inclusivity and the power of different voices around the table. And I will tell you, we've had thousands of men brave enough and strong enough to be Girl Scouts. They are leading co-troops, right? They are, they're taking leadership mantles. They're the cookie dads. And what we found, again, through our research, a girl's biggest impression sometimes around leadership styles and their ability to lead is actually the male figure in their life. And what we know right now is that the STEM industry is one of the biggest market opportunities for our girls. But because of opinions they're given in class, they really start opting out of STEM classes very early on, even in middle school. And when we did a recent study around STEM, we found that 74% of high school girls actually wanted to understand science, technology, engineering, math, and actually had a passion for it. But when we asked them to rate a STEM career with all other options in their future, a STEM career actually rated almost to the bottom of their list, actually below staying at home and raising their children. So how is that going to impact you? 
It means that girls, and clearly we need more engineers and, and more scientists, but they're not taking the appropriate classes in junior high and high school to allow them to opt into those higher level courses in college. So you're probably wondering then what's happening? Well, because we actually run the largest STEM program for girls in the world, we're trying to help you. We're trying to introduce STEM at a very, very early age for these girls. And of course, you may have seen the results of some of those activities because we actually run the largest entrepreneurial program in the world for girls. It's called the Cookie Program. And many people say, well, Anna, you know, what's the secret around that? And basically, we allow girls to run their own business, right? They are understanding marketing and, you know, how to make sure their delivery system is prepared for the onslaught of customers. But they were very clear with us that, yes, we like being entrepreneurs and business leaders, but we need an e-commerce platform. So in the last couple of years, we've built that multi-channel e-commerce platform for them. It's called Digital Cookie. And their first year, they blew through their goals. This year, it went nationwide. And I will tell you, again, they're beating their goals. They will raise, just on this singular platform, $7 million. In their larger program, in one quarter of the year, they will raise $800 million. So for those of you who have a business college and university, they're going to be your future students. They get it and they love it. And all that money stays local. I don't get a penny. Because they use it to actually fund their take action projects. You know, for me, it's a no-brainer, but sometimes I have to explain um, to many people why we need to be investing in girls this way. And Fortunately for me, I was surrounded by leaders who understood the power of investing in girls. That's why I became a Girl Scout. I grew up in a very small community. Uh, it was a farm community in the middle of the desert in Arizona. I thought it was the epicenter of the world, um, but it was a very small town. And my family, my grandmother had come from Mexico, and we had heard about a Girl Scout troop forming in our little community. And I wanted to join because my best friend was a Girl Scout. So I come home, and I'm trying to explain this to my grandmother in Spanish. And she says, wait, 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 what is this? And I said, well, you know, we're going to wear uniforms. She goes, oh, no. Oh, no, mijita. You're not joining the military. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, 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 no. And then I said, but grandma, I'm going to be selling cookies. It's going to be great. Oh, no, mijita, we're not that poor. And then the last straw was I, was t I was told her that I was going to go camping, you know, outside. She goes, oh, no. You're not going to go back to a migrant camp. And if you go camping, you're going to take your two brothers. <laughs> but long story short, our brand was so relevant that they allowed me to join. At the age of 12, Girl Scouts taught me about environmental justice issues. I was on fire. I had to do this. And because of that, I decided to become a lawyer at the age of 12. And people are like, wait, wait, wait a minute. What's going on here? Because if you looked at the data around me, and I had a lot of data because I was a Head Start baby, right? I was a daughter of Mexican immigrants, farm worker, child. And so clearly, the educators in the community wanted to ensure that I had an opportunity. So a whole community of educators basically tackled the issues for me. I didn't even know I was poor. I didn't even know that all the data was pointing me, unfortunately, to probably teen pregnancy issues, drugs, gang activity. But my middle school and high school teacher said, not on our watch. And they made sure that I understood the power of an education. And I will tell you that my parents, although not having a college education, knew that that was the key to my future. So I'm proud to say that my parents sent two of their children to Ivy League schools, and we are now paying it forward because we know the power of that education. So again, what does Girl Scouts do for other girls in this country? And that's where I want to end because I want to have time to have a conversation with you. How does this tie to your work? Well, first of all, we studied our Girl Scout alum. Currently today, we have 59 million living Girl Scout alum in this country. One in two American women wore our uniform one time in her life. 
and it made a huge impact. And when we turned 100 in 2012, I went to the Oval Office to present that report to the President of the United States. And I said to him, Mr. President, let me tell you about the impact of our work. First of all, when we compared our Girl Scout alum to non-alum, we found some interesting findings. First of all, our Girl Scout alum are very actively engaged in your local communities. They're volunteering. And our Girl Scout alums who are mothers are volunteering more in their kids' schools than non-alums. Two, they are really happy about the decisions they made in their life whether it was their life partnerships, their career choices, what they're doing with their talents. Three, we clearly know that they went on to get a higher level of education than non-alums. They went on to get their BAs, their MBAs, their PhDs, their JDs. And they're earning more money per year than non-alum, on average $12,000 more a year, which means they're bringing more resources to their families. And fifth, Mr. President, they vote, and they vote often. To which he said, how many alum do you have? <laughs> so clearly, we are your pipeline. We are your pipeline. And this year, interesting enough, our highest award in Girl Scouting is celebrating their 100th anniversary. How many of you know what the, and shout it out, what is the highest award that Boy Scouts earn? What is the equivalent for Girl Scouts? Thank you, the gold award. So my question is, how do we bring that level of acknowledgement to this same award for girls? And we've done a study, and results will be coming out here shortly, and I'm happy to share with you. We went state by state and looked at all the state universities in this country to compare what colleges provide college scholarships to Eagle Scouts and is there an equivalent award for our gold award recipients. And we will understand how we're investing in girls. And because I clearly know that on an annual basis of all the billions of dollars that we give in a philanthropic way in this country, only 7% go to women and girl causes. So I need your help, we need your help, to ensure that people understand the power of investing in girls. Because at the end of the day, they are our future workforce, they are our leaders, and they will get us into the future together. So with that, let's go ahead and take some questions from the audience, because I can go on and on about what we do in Girl Scouts, but I do want to have a, a conversation with you. I ask for the privilege of the first question. You know, one of the things, Anna, that you have done in your leadership of Girl Scouts USA is you have really moved through a very deliberate strategic planning process and very deliberate modernization. I mean, you talk about digital cookie now like it was, oh, we did digital cookie. Um, but those of us in the room who are leading colleges and universities and are, are, are really trying to retrofit, again, these 20th century sure. or sometimes 19th century institutions into 21st century models. Can you talk a little bit about your journey as a leader in managing change? Absolutely. So um, that's a conversation, isn't it? We're all change agents, and in my career, my bosses, including Janet Politano, who I understand was here earlier um, in your conference. She's a rock star. Oh, by the way, lifetime member of Girl Scouts, just saying. Um, anytime I worked for somebody, they always sent me in to organizations that needed either a startup or a turnaround. So that has been my career for 30 years. When I came to Girl Scouts, I had actually come from the field, and many people said, why Girl Scouts, right? Well, I understood the power of a grassroots organization. So when I reached the national organization, I assumed that we had everything in place to really take the organization forward, because my predecessors had done a lot in the field. We had merged 330 local councils down to 112. And it was a huge change, a difficult change. So when I came to the national organization, I'm a real big believer in feedback. 
Feedback's a gift. Growth is optional. And so I went out and I asked 12,000 of our customers, so the CEOs of our local councils, because we're in a federated system. I asked the opinions of our board chairs. I asked the opinions of volunteers and girls, the 350 people at headquarters, 12,000 of them. And for those of you who use a, uh, use a net promoter score, how many of you use a net promoter score in your work? OK, let me explain to you what MPS is. Most um, for-profit organizations use MPS to understand the power of their brand and whether or not they're giving a service or a product their customers want to buy. So at the time I was doing this work, the best bank in the country, best net promoter score, which is on a scale of a negative 100 is the worst score you can get, and a positive 100 is the best score you can get. And basically what the MPS does, it tests people's ability or comfort in basically referring other people your service or product. So the best net promoter score in, in the bank industry in 2012 was the USAA in San Antonio, Texas. If you look at the airlines, again, best airlines in the country were Southwest Airlines and JetBlue with a net promoter score of about a positive 70-75. My net promoter score, meaning headquarters, net promoter score to our field in 2020, excuse me, 2012, was a negative 47. 54% of the time when a local leader in my Girl Scout Council needed assistance, they went to an outside organization versus headquarters. Feedback's a gift. Now, my team could have said, oh, wait a minute. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. We do a great job at headquarters. But I clearly knew if we didn't have an alignment with our field, we would never be able to tackle the issues in front of us. Like most youth serving organizations, we were declining in membership for over a decade. And we needed to do much more. So we literally implemented a new strategic plan to really revive what we were doing. I will tell you now that in October 2015, we retested our net promoter score with our field, and we're now at a positive 87. And thank you, thank you. But with that came a lot of change. I'm not going to um, get up here and tell you it was easy. We had to completely redesign our headquarters. 125 positions literally had to be reformatted and changed, which meant that we did have to make some major decisions around the people who were working with us going forward. We needed data analytics skills. We needed people to understand a new technology framework. I hired the first CIO in 100 years, the first general counsel in 100 years, the first COO that really came from a large global company. And it's been a journey. And that's where you dig deep, right? Because when you're in a leadership role with a lot of change, sometimes it gets personal. Can you relate to that? No, none of you have experienced that, right? But it's working. Um, we are really seeing uh, the influx of people who really want to work with our brand. Um, last year, Fast Company Magazine named us one of the most top 10 most innovative nonprofits in the world. And that's because we have focused very clearly on who is our customer. And we are morphing, interestingly enough, into a really focused technology company. Because that's where girls are. They are digital natives. And because we know that strategy has to be focused on the clear deliverables going forward, I'm convening our leaders on a really, really interesting pace, meaning I'm bringing our leadership in the field and the national and global stage together to understand that we have one brand and one mission and one strategy. Four years ago, I had 113 different strategies. That's the journey we've been on, and we will continue to be on it. I'm really excited that the ability to leverage our brand has enabled us to really bring more strategic partners to the table. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Just a quick question on how do how does the Girl Scouts remain 
relevant to communities that maybe have not been part of that program in your last 100 plus years? Yeah, well, it's also letting them know they were part of our organization. That, again, is, is the challenge, the opportunity, right? Um, to explain to local communities that we've been in their communities for 100 years. You know, part of being a leader is also understanding the perceptions around your organization. I clearly own the fact that many communities think that we serve a very insular section of girls, perhaps suburbia, perhaps non-diverse communities. But the reality is we've always been very diverse. We had, you know, the first Latina troupe in the country um, was coordinated probably in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, and so for us, we clearly know that we need to share that story. In addition, um, I realize that as the first woman of color in this role in 100 years, I also have the opportunity to explain that we are inclusive. Um, I know that it's always, you know, people look at your leadership team, right? Um, you can't say you're diverse if your leaders aren't diverse. So when I came in four years ago, um, there was a leadership team there. Um, there was no diversity. Um, and now I can say I have 11 executives around the table, probably the most diverse leadership team we've ever had in history which also includes men, because you've got to have gender balanced leadership to make sure you're running an organization effectively going forward. In addition, um, I will tell you, always being in that inclusive space, also needs to we also need to understand how we relate to those communities. So I'm a perfect example. My mother was not a Girl Scout. My grandmother was not a Girl Scout. So we didn't have an affinity to our organization. So how do we recruit volunteers into our organization that represent those communities, our influence in those communities. So again, that is our opportunity and challenge because as you know with the growing demographics in this country, our largest customer base that's growing are girls of color, specifically Latina girls. So we have to understand, is our program and culture relevant? I'll give you an example, not from a Latina perspective, from an African American perspective. We've had a long history with African American communities, but I was recently working with some girls and we had some camp people talking about what we're gonna do with programming and they were talking about taking the girls swimming and the African American girls, I'm not going swimming. And we were like, well, why? It's fine. She's like, do you know how long it takes me to get the hair this way? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? But the team was like, we had no idea. Right? And so it's clearly understanding who your customer is. And, and, and if you're going to take a Latina girl, right, out of her community and may not have never been away from family and say, oh, I'm going to take your daughter for five days, put her in the woods with no, no electricity, and she can't take her cell phone. I'm going to tell you as a Latina mother, that doesn't ring true to me. Right? But how do we include more family events? so that the families get to know our organization and begin to trust us. That's our opportunity. And, and I really do believe that girls, again, because they're digital natives, they want to be connected to other people. And what I love about girls, they don't necessarily walk into issues and think, oh, this is a racial issue. They're sometimes colorblind, which I love. They're only taught hate. They don't, they're not born with that muscle. And that's why I love working with girls, because they don't see the barriers. They don't see the, you know, the lines of demarcation between communities. And so that's why we're always trying to empower them to own their voice. And when they may be the only ones thinking that way of being inclusive, we've got to support them as adults. We do. And that's why I love working for the organization we work for. Any other questions? Right there in the middle? Hi. Hi. I just want to say, uh, maybe this is a bit anecdotal, but don't underestimate or undersell the alignment, the integration of the Girl Scouts and higher education, your audience today. I use the examples of my own daughter at my college. Oh. Servant leadership, peer mentoring, case-based, problem-based learning. Mm -hmm. um, and it strikes a spark or a chord with all those in, the, in, the, in our learning space who say, yeah, I get that, or I remember that, or those who didn't get to take part wish they did. So the conversations I'm having with a 10-year-old are absolutely resonating with the work that I'm doing with people who typically act a little older than 10-year-olds. So just thank you. <laughs> thank you. 
No, it's true. And, and we need your help with this. We've been, I will admit, sometimes an in, in sort of inner focused organization, we've been really focused internally for a lot of, a lot of years. And, and that's kind of a trait sometimes as servant leaders. We don't talk about the achievements that we have. And so we expect people to understand what we've done. But what I've realized as you are trying to galvanize communities around girls and youth in general, you've got to talk about it. And our girls are actually our best ambassadors because they're showing what they do every day. But sometimes we discount that, right? And so I need your help to really lift up their stories. Way in the back. I hear what you're saying when you see that you're excited when you find that they're colorblind. But do you teach them uh, not to be colorblind? Uh, because many students at my university, a little uh, university out there in Walla Walla, Washington, huh? they come proud that they're colorblind and they don't see the problem. And, and, and it's so difficult to teach them in America there is color, and certain of us are treated differently because of our color. And I want uh, those young ladies in Girl Scout to be able to be part of the solution. But if they don't see the problem, they can't be part of the solution. So though you're excited to have them like that, do you help them in a positive way to recognize there's problem with color? Absolutely, so let me tell you the approach they take. They realize the differences, but what they clearly inherently do is they try to take action in their communities to make a difference, to highlight those issues. So instead of saying, well, that's a problem, we're not going to deal with it, we actually charge them and empower them to take action on those issues at the very earliest ages. So it's not even just around racial issues, which is clearly um, an issue of contention for them sometimes, but because, again, the growing population of children are multiracial, it becomes a little nuanced, right? So you will see our girls taking action on those issues all across the country, but they're also tackling other issues like human trafficking right, and teen um, suicide issues. So again, they don't sit around and say the world is perfect, there are no problems. We actually give them the ability to understand the power of their voice and that they don't need other people to really wage that opportunity and make a difference in people's lives or communities. We empower them to lead that opportunity. So that's how we do it. I will tell you that as the girls graduate, as they go on to get their gold award, many of those issues come up front and center. The issue we sometimes have is the adults in our communities are a little nervous about allowing girls to take action around those issues. And what we have to teach the adults is, hey, we've trained them to be leaders. We've trained them to use their voice to say, that's inequality, that's unfair, that's injustice and that we need to support them when they take those, stuff, those really, really tough stands in their community. So I'm very proud as they do not shy away from those issues, and you'll notice across your campuses, if you look at specifically the female leadership on cam campus, ask them if they were part of our organization, and I will, I will make a bet with you that there's a preponderance of Girl Scout leaders on your campus taking action around those issues. But thank you for that opportunity to clarify. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and close. You guys are awfully quiet this morning. Come on. Are you guys tired? All right. Well, I will close just to say that um, there are other issues that we are tackling. Um, again, for us, we reach all girls. We have a program called Girl Scout Beyond Bars where young ladies who have mothers who are incarcerated, we take Girl Scout troop meetings into the prison. So that we, and we've shown with this program that we've been able to actually deal with the issues of, you know, again, certain families having the ability to, to break the cycle of those issues. In addition, um, we understand that these girls will continue to be change agents. And as you go back to your campuses, I encourage you, there are many Girl Scout alum who are trying to start Girl Scout campus groups. Um, they're trying to make a difference. We also understand that we have an opportunity this year 
because of the election in progress to really highlight the issues impacting different communities. So I really encourage you to continue to partner with us. I want to thank you all for all the work you're doing across this country to really empower youth. I know it will lead to great success for this country, and I hope to be with you again to share some of those successes. Have a good trip back.